You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. This episode is supported by FX's Dear Mama, the saga of Afini and Tupac Shakur. This deeply personal five-part docuseries from award-winning director Alan Hughes shares an illuminating saga of mother and son. She was a revolutionary, intellect, and leader in the Black Panther Party. He was a rapper and political visionary who became known as one of the greatest rap artists of all time. FX's Dear Mama, all new Fridays on FX, stream on Hulu. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Dear Culture, the podcast for by and about the culture here on the Grill Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson, and today we have a very special guest. Uh, you know him from television. He has a show, United Shades of America, which has delved into all manner of shenanigans uh, in this country's ongoing race discussion uh, he had the all important. We need to talk about Cosby documentary, which also delved into all kind of conversations we needed to have in this country. Uh, he had a podcast. Which I love the title of this. So I want to make sure I get this right. Uh, Denzel Washington is the greatest actor of all time, period, which you delved into movies where Denzel was it. Love that. Um, you know, you have an upcoming documentary, which I cannot wait to talk about uh, from HBO, which is screening now called A Thousand Percent Me Growing Up Mixed. And your discourse has led to what had to be the most awkward kickback of all time with the KKK. Don't you think that by wearing the same robes that you're that it's hard to separate those two different clans? Like I have an opportunity to wear a Klansman's robe. Why? Because I'm white and I believe in the idea of rituals and beliefs of the people of Klan. I was raised that way. So <laughs> my guest today is none other than W. Kamau Bell, comedian, writer, director, podcaster, host. How are you doing, brother? You know, just a black man trying to stay employed and feed his kids. That's what I am right here. Listen, you're doing a good job of it. And I have to ask what I think might be the most important question I will ever ask on any show I ever do for the rest of my life. Yes. How often do you get confused for Questlove? Oh, my God. <laughs> Here's the funny thing about it. There was, a, there was a time where I talked about it a lot. And then I felt like I was talking about it so much that I was probably annoying him by talking about it. So I stopped really? talking about it. But then he said he got confused. He got started getting confused for me. I was like, okay, so at least this is a two-way street. And then I thought, well, it's probably, at some point, I, well, I'm probably big enough now so it doesn't have any more. I, I literally got off the plane in Sundance this year, and somebody walked up to me, grabbed a picture, and said, can you sign this? And I said, wait, who am I? They said Questlove, and me and my wife <laughs> laughed and laughed and laughed. So no, it is, it is, it is. And then I, you know, and he, you know, he was at Sundance at the time. We didn't see each other, right. but like, if he's if he's actually in the vicinity of where I am, then it's going to happen. Like, fifty percent of the time, people recognize me. If he's not in the, if I'm in a place where people think he might be, like, like right now I'm in New York City, it's going to happen. Like one out of ten people are going to think I'm. But yeah, it, it is a regular occurrence, and even. And sometimes I pull up pictures like I'm a lot more gray than he is. He's got a fuller beard. Ah. Actually, his game is really on. He's got like some sort of like some some dreads or something going. Doesn't matter. I mean, y'all are two tall black dudes, man, with big hair. Like it's nobody and, ever and, and nobody ever asked me if I'm Questlove. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm not mad at it. He's one of the coolest people who's ever walked the planet, and I am not. So I'm happy for the association in 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 whatever way it comes. I. I always say I look like Questlove if he had, instead of being the drummer for the Roots, he had, he had sold insurance. <laughs> I love it. There you go. True story. I get confused for a kid from Kid and Play often, or people, not confused, people tell me I look like him. So much so that one time my wife and I were in New Orleans, and this dude who was a bouncer at a club saw me on the street and pulled me over. He's like, yo, are you, is Kid your dad? I was like, <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> And they let me in the club is. free. They were like, come on in, yo, it's kids, kids. I, it was crazy. So, you know, I not quite the same thing. I'm not putting out culturally relevant stuff, but, you know, it got me in a club in New Orleans for free. So you take the wins yeah, where you, you can. You know, no, you take the wins where you can. Yeah, no, I, I just I just felt especially bad last year if Questlove was getting confused for me with the fact that I'd done that Cosby doc because I was like, that attention is not going to be as fun as the other attention he might have got when he was confused for me. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, speaking of docs, you have a documentary that's currently screening in various places I saw called 1000% Me Growing Up Mixed. I'm really proud of the current and future generation of mixed kids that are being loud and proud. 
Our kids have been instruments of healing. I want to ask about this specifically for two reasons. One, I mixed. Two, I remember, so when I wrote, I wrote that article years ago about how Trump ruined my relationship with my white mother. It made me famous for like a day in the black community and maybe even the white community. Um, but so much so that I got invited to be a part of a documentary about the loving generation, right? Now, Whoa. I'm somebody who grew up with my black father and black stepmother. So I, kind of, I grew up black. My dad was always like, you know, your mom is white, you are not. So I grew up like black with a white mother, so to speak. Yeah. And I was always kind of judgmental about mixed kids. I'm like, y'all, you just black or whatever. Like you ain't the mixed thing is mm -hmm. annoying. But mm -hmm. the documentary really opened my eyes and enlightened me about like the plight and travails of a lot of other mixed people. So I've, I've stopped being less judgmental. You know, I, I was not one of the chorus of Meghan Markle haters who like you just a black woman, like calm your, calm your jets. So this documentary, which is billed as multiracial kids and their families share the joys and struggles of growing up mixed in the Bay Area. Um, what is this documentary going to teach me about my mixedness? <laughs> I mean, I think here's the thing. First of all, I totally understand what you're saying, because I have noticed since since I've been working on this doc, you know, the algorithm now knows I'm reading things about mixed race folks. So the algorithm is sending me a lot more mixed race content. And I have and I've been very made very aware of the fact that there's not a lot of space in many black folks uh, heads to hear from mixed people about their experience. Uh, yes. they, they to hear from mixed people or, or to hear from black mixed race black people about what their struggles are or what they're dealing with. And I understand where that comes from, but at the same time, there's got to be some space for these people to talk about who they are and what they, and how they experience the world. And especially as that demographic grows, which it does grow every year, the there's just going to have to be a way that this community can talk about their experience. And also the way we talk about the film, it's not less of one thing and less of another, it's both and. If I ask you what ingredients to mix you up? Black, Asian, and love. And a llama and a corgi. I explained to my daughters from very early age, like, look, you can be mixed, you can consider yourself half black and half white, you also are black, but you're definitely not white. So it was a way to right. go, look, all of these things can exist at one time, but the one that can't exist is white, and even if even for my middle kid who's who's light skinned and has sort of wavy hair, you can, you are not a white person. No matter what the world may try to identify you as, that you cannot identify yourself in that way. And also on top of that, like seeing my oldest daughter interact with her friends who are mixed and not mixed black and white, mixed of all sorts of different mixes, I just notice is like feels like they're drawn to each other in some way. Like there's something about that mixed experience that like brings them together. So that's where I first started thinking, there's some sort of conversation here. And it was always about, I want to hear from the kids before they get fucked up by their adulthood. <laughs> right. You know, it is interesting because I, I look, I do agree. Like the, the violin is very tiny for mixed kids struggles. It, it really sure. is like people. I remember I used to write articles about this early on in our early VSB days. And I would like write an article about being mixed in. The the response was always, don't nobody care about this. We don't care about no mixed kids struggle like. You just light skin. Just enjoy it. Enjoy it. Go go enjoy your light skinness and whatever nonsense that comes with and stuff like that. But I do think you're right. There's a story. So for instance, my my sister. I have you know I have a younger sister, and you know, little girls tend to look at their mom one way, right? You know, so she was always very much like I'm not I'm not black. I'm peach. I'm like mommy. I'm like mommy. You know, she was very much actively seeking it until she got to high school and fell in love with Tupac. And then all of a sudden she was the blackest thing out there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it was, you know, there was, she was thugged yeah. out hardcore. Yeah. Like we, she went through her militant phase in high school, you know, and I'm in college, yeah. like heavy into that stuff. But like, what was one of the most interesting stories you got, like from talking to the kids about this kind of, like their mixed experience? Like what was something that was really interesting that stood out? I think the thing that, that that a lot of times people struggle with in the mixed conversation is like, well, which do you identify with? Like, which one? Are, but which one? If you basically sort of like pick a side, like you were saying right. earlier. And these kids are like very capable of not picking a side and not being confused about their ability to not pick a side. So there's not like, it's not like I am this, it's, it's not this or this, or it is not some newness. It's both. It's, it's like, I am white, I am, I am Latinx, I am indigenous. So we have kids who are like, three different, you know, we have a kid who's like, I mean, this one is sort of, her dad is half black and half white. 
Her mom is half black and half Korean. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, okay. you're going to tell her she's not mixed? <laughs> you're going to tell her she doesn't have the... And she says, and the problem she struggles with is access to her blackness because people will say, you're not black enough to say this or do this. And it puts her in this camp where it's like, what's she going to do? Go hang out with the other uh, half black, quarter, quarter Korean, quarter white kids? And so <laughs> what you're doing is you're putting this kid into a corner by herself, which eventually is going to leave her by herself and... and isn't a healthy way to lead your life. So for me, it's this idea of like, I think there's a discussion about just mixedness in general that mixed people can have and should have that the rest of us should step out of and let them have it. And maybe with this film, you can be present for it, but it doesn't have to have, the, it doesn't actually have to have anything to do with you if you're not a part of this community. Yeah, and it is fascinating. So, you know, I'm mixed. My dad is a black man from Alabama. My, my mom is a white woman from France. My okay. wife is also mixed, but she's mixed Ghanaian and Italian. Like her, her father's from Italy. Like she's, she grew up in Ghana and moved to America when she was like 11. Right. So we're both mixed, but the experience is very different. Right. Like in, in a crowd where she grew up, you know, that was very desired, so to speak, you know, that, that kind of, you know, like yeah. the, the racial issues are, are everywhere. Right. So we have, you know, I have four kids and my wife and I have three. Now she, my wife went to Howard. I went to Morehouse. So we're both very heavily leaning into the black side, right? There's not, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of mixedness. It's like we're black people who happen to have like white parents kind of thing, right? What, what? But we have two, one of my boys is darker than everybody in the house. <laughs> got the, the standard, got to go to the, got to go to the barbershop and get edged up, lined up, whatever. Two yep. of my kids though are very light skinned, wavy hair boys, right? So <laughs> I imagine the conversations that they're going to have when they get older are going to be like, what are you like? Wait, your what parents hell? are black, like that kind of thing. And it's going to open up all kind of combos. But it's also fascinating to kind of look at them because we raised them black, right? They don't have any questions about it. Like they know that they're black, but I know it's coming. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. I don't know that they're going to be the kind of kids that would gravitate towards like the mixed community. But I am mm -hmm. glad that there is like so much more agency now to decide who you are and what that means. Right. And like what that means for your identity and who you're going to be growing up. You know, because I, when I was younger, that just was, it wasn't an option. Now, granted, I was in Alabama and nobody, you black, yeah. white, or it's hate to say this. It's a lot of generational yeah. too. Like there's not, there was, a, you know, when I was a kid, it was biracial, but I don't know if I knew any biracial kids because nobody was identifying themselves that way. Right. Right. You know. Fascinating. I love, I, I love these conversations. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. We come right back with Kamal Bell talking about a thousand percent me growing up mixed here on Dear Culture. We're back here on Dear Coach. I'm with W. Kamal Bell. We're talking about a documentary he has called A Thousand Percent Me, Growing Up Mixed. As somebody who's delving into this, what are the the conversations that you see that are happening constantly that are we just can't run away from anymore? I mean, I, I like here's the thing. I understand like recently, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, again, the algorithm is sending me things about mixedness. There was a whole thing. Remember, I'm sure you must have talked about this at some point. But Logic did his cover of uh, uh, yes. uh, Today Was a Good Day. <laughs> Just waking up in the morning, gotta thank God. I don't know, but today seems kind of odd. No they were good the day. And, no and in it, he, he, you know, he's doing a cover, so he drops the, he drops the end bomb. And, uh, and uh, there was all this talk about it. Can he, is he, is he black enough to do that? Is he black enough to do that? That's its own discussion. I'm, I'm gonna let right. uh, people have that discussion. But I saw a segment from the Joe Budden podcast where they were talking about logic and Joe Budden. That's one of his Hates hobbies. logic. Hating on logic, and he admits it's one of his hobbies. But Melissa Ford was on there just talking about it, and she's mixed. I didn't know she was mixed until this conversation came up. And she explicitly talks about, like, nobody wants to hear me talk about what it is to be mixed. Black people don't have any space for this, and sort of, so therefore, I don't talk about it. And, with, and the funny thing about the Joe Budden podcast, me is like, they will talk about anything, but the whole room got uncomfortable, sort of like, how do we talk about the mixed race experience? I feel like... It is in the black community. It is still one of those. It's one of those other third rail conversations where it's like, if we look like we're, it feels like if we're making space for the mixed race conversa conversation, we're making space for whiteness. And the last yeah. thing we want to do in the black community is make more space for whiteness. And to me, that's just proof that white supremacy is doing its job to fuck us up. That we can't, we can't talk about ourselves amongst ourselves without being trying to be aware of what whiteness is doing in that conversation. When it's like, when meanwhile, there's mixed people going like, I don't know where to talk about my experience. Yeah, and, and I mean, so for me, yeah. this film is about like showing that like kids aren't as messed up about that until we mess them up. 
Man, that's super fast. Because, I mean, think about Obama, right? Like, we, like, you claim him hard because it's like, this is this is ours. Like, we, we yeah. got somewhere. We're st- Tiger Woods, I mean, listen. Yeah. We'll take Tiger as long as long as Tiger ain't go. You know, we accepted Tiger. We to play like, had, like, and I get it. We had the problem of like, what, Cobblin Asian. Wait a minute, bro. <laughs> right. Like, I think Obama kind of learned Tiger. And on the census, he had the option to pick mix. And Obama said, black, 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 black. Because he understood that like black people need to, need to see me claim my blackness. They don't want to see me claim my white mom, even though I was closer with my white mom than I was with my black dad, my Kenyan dad. So I think that like, the idea being that, like, I'm aware that this stuff is complicated, but the way we make it less complicated is by creating more space for the conversation. And as more and more mixed race people exist in the world, they're going to want to have that conversation. And the last thing I want is my daughters afraid to talk about their identity. Absolutely. The, the, the Obama combo was funny because it was the first time I'd seen so many white people trying to claim a black dude. Right. Like it was like, nah, he's actually mm-hmm. mixed guys like this is not a black man. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> Y'all created the one drop rule. Like we we over here abiding by the rules, exactly. dealing with all the white supremacy and all that comes with it. And now you want to change the rules because we got a presidential candidate that all of a sudden he's if he's not black, then who is? But right? I like, like him so much. I think he, I, I like him so much. He's got I'm gonna claim his I'm gonna claim his whiteness because I like him that much. Yeah. Hilarious, yeah, I, hilarious. That, and Obama was savvy in that and was like, you can claim me, but the, watch who I claim. Yeah, I I love it. I love I love the fact that that's a conversation that is something that that I I look forward to seeing the doc. I have not seen it yet, but as you know, as a mixed person who, like I said, I've learned that you know everybody's experience is different, and that my vantage point may it's not it's not necessarily outdated, but it's it's just limiting, right? Like I'm not gonna force everybody to conform to the way that I view my own upbringing and all that other stuff. So I look forward to seeing it because I'm genuinely curious about what it's like to see people who aren't encumbered by all the other crap. Like, again, I went to high school in Alabama, right? Ain't no choices. Yeah. You know, like, so there's, it's just a different way of looking at it. And, you know, even watching my own kids, how that will inform them. Um, well, so yeah, I look forward I, to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, let me be clear. Like, this is it, two, of, three of my, my, all three of my kids are in it, my daughters, but two of them talk in it. And my one, my middle kid is super light skinned with wavy hair, sort of has like what we call Moana hair. My oldest <laughs> kid and my youngest kid are, look like the classic, Cheerio commercial mixed race kids, like the the giant brown, light brown afro with the caramel colored skin. And so I know that in my house, the way they grow up and their conversations are going to be different about it. But also this was filmed in the Bay Area. So the Bay Area just has access to a lot of different conversations about identity that the rest of the country doesn't often have. Just because we live in a diverse community does not mean that racism and all that doesn't happen. A high percentage of interracial couples have no idea what the experience is for this child that they brought into the world. I know the way that these, and, and the documentary is centered around children. So the way that these Bay Area kids are talking about their experience is really an example for how I think we can all talk about it, but I know it's not the way every all the mixed race kids in the country are talking about it. Absolutely. All right, we'll take one more break here, and we're going to come back with, I uh, have a couple questions for you, then some black fashions and black accommodations here on Dear Culture. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture. I'm still here with W. Kamau Bell. And, you know, I we're talking about mixed race, and which is a conversation about race. So I got to ask the all-important question. Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark, man, what did this expose about our issues with <laughs> racial, like our racial issues? Like as somebody who delves and lives in this world constantly of talking about this stuff and breaking it down, what are your thoughts? I mean, you know, there's not a better example of the system of white supremacy that we live in than go than seeing something that ultimately sports like I, and I'm a sports fan but it's not that important on just a basic level it's just a, it's a way for us to distract ourselves and also to find some joy in a life filled with pain so it's want to be clear about that which is important but it's not like it's not like whether or not we're going to invade another country so I'm just going to be clear about that so it is meant to be a distraction and it's meant to be a thing that we just sit back and, and enjoy and one of the things that we explicitly enjoy about it, people who follow sports on real, we enjoy when athletes preen and and, and when when joy we enjoy athletes being better than us and being proud of it and and being a little bit shitty about it. If we're honest, you know, there's, there's there's some of the greatest moments in sports are athletes being like, "Man, look how good I am." You know, my favorite Michael Jordan moment is the shrug, <laughs> like the moment where he's like, "I didn't even know I was this good." Apparently, right. I'm even better than I thought. And sports is filled with that. NFL is filled with players 
with players sacking quarterbacks and standing over them and yelling in their face, and we all cheer these things. So I think there's there's this level of like, but if it's a black person versus a white person, suddenly all that goes away, and it's about this poor, pure, innocent white girl who is not asked to be poor, pure, innocent. Right. And this black woman who, as she said very clearly, has felt like she's been described as a thug and is, and is not a good person. So suddenly now all the stuff that is in that is embedded into sports goes away because this poor innocent white girl who is not asked for that protection is being is being uh, uh, assaulted assaulted in quotes by this black woman even though the white girl she's a, she's the thing she's doing to her is the thing that that white girl had done to other people so I think it is just a great example and so that's a, so not only the, was the reaction indicative of the system of white supremacy but then how white how quick white people. Who are who, many of whom were supposed to be on, who claimed to be on the team on team black folks, just were like, oh my god, like Absolutely. they ran to this white lady, <laughs> like, like, like sprinted, sprinted to do it, and you're like, wait, I thought you were cool. I mean, I, or also, I thought you were an asshole. What, like, when you see white people who are known to be assholes being like, that was classless. Wait, what, what, uh, you, but you're classless. I'm not trying to, you know, save Dave, Port, Dave Portnoy, but I'm saying like, what, how, how are you going to call out? And then you got. Keith Oldman, I thought you were one of the good white folks. Like, I thought you were one of the, like, to see how whiteness just, it just, like, bubbled up out of them, and they couldn't stop it because they wanted to protect this white woman who was not asking for their protection. Absolutely. Hold that thought. Let's take a break. And we're back. Well, we have come to the end of my show where we do two of my favorite segments. One is a black fashion. It's a confession about your blackness where we ask people to share something that people might be surprised to know about them because they're black. So do you have a black fashion? So is the thing, like, I got to ask questions because I realize, so is it something that is like, like, oh, I didn't, like, oh, that that black guy loves polka music. Is it like that? <laughs> or is it that like... kind of, it could be anything. So a lot of times people are like, you know, these are movies I haven't seen. People would be surprised. Uh, no, people ain't seen Friday. But look, it also sometimes is things, people have interesting hobby and fascinations that are like, huh, interesting. I would not have guessed that. So if the gamut is the gamut is available to you. I think because people see my blackness in some sort of like he's not he's not the he's not the he's not black like again, it's really like you I felt like I was like an honorary mixed person because <laughs> I was like black but not doing my blackness right. You know, like I was like you know, I was, <laughs> I was called you know, I, I was called an Oreo at various points in my life, maybe even recently. I just turned off the comments. But uh but so I think for me it's like I was, my mom has, I've celebrated Kwanzaa my entire life. Like my mom has been, cel- I, we've been celebrating Kwanzaa since I was a little kid. Like there are literal pictures that say Christmas tree. And then the day after Christmas, it says underneath Kwanzaa bush. Like, so for me, Kwanzaa was like a thing that only, and when I was celebrating, I felt like we were the only house in the neighborhood that celebrated it. Like there was not I was going like, to say that could be true. That could very yeah, well no, be true. Thing, like. There wasn't like a community Kwanzaa celebration in Mattapan, Boston, uh, when we were celebrating Kwanzaa. So for me, I feel like that gives me a level of blackness that black people who think I'm not black enough. I'm like, you, you, are, you, you don't, you don't have. I got this punch on my black card that you don't have. That's like yeah. I have. I've, I've been celebrating blackness since before mainstream America and even mainstream Black America knew. Uh, I've been celebrating Kwanzaa since before mainstream Black America knew what Kwanzaa was. Which you're absolutely right because I think everybody's kind of on board with Kwanzaa now in a way that's kind of surprising. Like. Really? Because I remember when we all like clown Kwanzaa, like nonstop, like we were 100 percent out on Kwanzaa. That's see, that's good. That's that's good stuff, because I didn't know that. And honestly, I think people might be surprised by that. So, boom. yeah, I, I just I, I, you know, everything else I've already said, like I didn't grow up like listening to hip hop, even though I'm the same age as hip hop. I did not grow up listening to hip hop the way the black. But I've, already, I've talked about that. That's the, I feel like I've given away all my black confessions. You have I've built my career on on being black in ways that people don't expect. Awesome. All right. Well, we also like to palate cleanse on occasion with a black oh, recommendation, here's right? Here's here's oh, just go. go. Okay. What you got? Music. This is a black. Fa- I just feel like this. I'm thinking. Now I'm thinking about uh, uh, one of the first concerts I ever went to was a Tom Petty concert. Okay. Now, well, now I'm going the other way. I'm going like, and and I've been to a great, and I've been when my best friend was a Grateful Dead head, so I've been to several Grateful Dead concerts as a as a teenager. Not as a, oh. like now it might be cool for black people to be at a Grateful Dead concert, right? But back then it was not. It They're was selling not. those T-shirts at, at Target right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, that's I'm the, saying, that's saying the in the nineties. I'm just trying to get. I'm I'm trying to give you both. I'm trying to give you celebrated Kwanzaa, 
went to a Grateful Dead concert. So you can take we the call Black that Press. well-rounded. Well-rounded. We call that well-rounded. Because I used to listen to Motley Crue. In middle school, I was a Motley Crue dude. Like, Motley Crue and Skid yeah. Row and all. That, those are my bands. Yeah. 100%. So. That's, that's funny. Yesterday, I saw a black dude wearing a Nirvana t-shirt. And I'm like, you have no idea that I died for you to wear that t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea how much I suffered. So you could walk down 6th Avenue wearing a Nirvana t-shirt, black man. There you go. I love that. All right. So we also add black recommendations to the end of our show, which is a recommendation by Ford about something black. Um, could be anything, anything you're reading up on, whatever you got. So do you have a black recommendation for us? I do. I do. It's a YouTuber, a black YouTuber. I don't know if you're familiar with him. FD Signifier. I'm not. FD Put Signifier. Him game. He's on YouTube and he's a black YouTuber who is like, I, uh, he's in Atlanta now, but I think he's originally from Chicago. But he like does these like hour long breakdowns on whatever's going on in black culture and like really deep dives that are very well thought out about things going on in black culture. If black men are lagging behind black women at every level of education, but then we get to the highest levels of education for the first time on this entire graph, they outdo black women. What confounding factors do you think best explain that outcome? Uh, he's got he's got like four hundred forty one thousand subscribers, so he's not small. But he, I just don't know that he's like he. I don't know that I don't know that he's known, known, known. And I also don't know. I sort of ha- watch his things, and every now and again, I'm afraid he starts talking about things like, "Wait, is he about to talk about me?" But yeah, I don't think he's not like because <laughs> he, he 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 speaks the truth, and and I agree with him like ninety nine percent of the time. And I probably imagine if he said something about me, I'd be like, "Yeah, he's got a point." But uh, like he's got like. <laughs> hour and a half long breakdowns on like like two part videos that are like hour and a half long about like sort of the career of Kanye West and how it affects him personally what Kanye's life and career have come to very sensitive but super smart FD signifier on YouTube all right I'll definitely check that out that put me up on game I can appreciate that um when's the documentary coming out it'll be out sooner than later it'll be out it'll be up it'll be out before the kids are out of school all right then, then I think that works uh, yeah. My brother, W. Kamau Bell, I appreciate your time, your your attention to detail in these discussions about these racial discourse discussions. We love them. We appreciate everything that you do. Um, it all matters. I mean, literally, almost everything that you do is something that illuminates some aspect of this insanely hilarious and odd uh, social construct of race um, in all of its glory and destruction. Wow. So. So I, thank you feel, for your I work, feel brother. Thank you. I've always been inspired and jealous of your writing. So thank you for having me. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for checking out Dear Culture, which is a an original program of the Grill Black Podcast Network. It is produced by Sasha Armstrong, edited by Jeff Trudeau, and Regina Griffin is our director of podcasts. Uh, again, my name is Panama Jackson. Thank you for listening. Have a black one. We started this podcast to talk about not just what Black writers write about, but how. Well, personally, it's on my bucket list to have one of my books banned. <laughs> I know that's probably bad, but Ooh. I think... Ooh, spicy. They were yelling, N-word, go home. And I was looking around for the N-word because I knew it couldn't be me because I was a queen. <laughs> but I am telling people to quit this mentality of identifying ourselves yeah. by our work, to start to live our lives. And to redefine the whole concept of how we work and where we work and why we work in the first place. My, my biggest strength throughout throughout my career has been having incredible mentors and specifically black women. I mean, I've been writing poetry since I was like eight. You know, I've been reading Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and Maya Angelou and so forth and so on since I was like a little kid. Like the banjo was blackly black, right? Mm-hmm. For Many, many, African. many years. Yes. Everybody knew. Because sometimes I'm just doing some Sam <laughs> that because <laughs> I just want to <laughs> do it. An honor to be here. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Keep shining bright. And we and, and like you said, we all keep writing black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts.